Uh, it was done over the course of several weeks, uh, interviewing 5,000 Egyptians from north to south, from rural to urban districts, and the findings were quite uh, remarkable. The mood really sought, uh, the poll really sought to assess the nation's mood uh, one year into the Morsi presidency and two and a half years after the Tahrir Square uprisings. Uh, Egyptians were asked about their confidence in state institutions, they were asked to evaluate Morsi's performance, and they were asked to talk about um, their hopes for the future and what emerged is a rather, I would say, pessimistic view uh, of the future for many uh, Egyptians. About 61% said that they're worse off today than they were five years ago, and a plurality of, of Egyptians had very little hope uh, for the future. Um, even more worrisome to me, and I'm sure we'll comment on this here, was the incredible polarization in Egyptian society uh, with Islamists and, and liberals on the opposite end of the spectrum. Well, here today with us uh, to discuss the poll, the findings, the implications of the poll is a, a fabulous panel uh, of Egypt experts who combined know an awful lot about this remarkable country. To my left, Dr. James Zogby, who conducted the poll. To my right, Dina Gerges, Ambassador Edward Walker, and Brian Kutoulis. And I just want to thank Brian and, and Dina for filling in at the last minute. Steve Clemens uh, had to cancel and he sends his apologies. Uh, very briefly, by way of introduction, um, and longer bios are in your handout, uh, James Zogby is the founder and president of the Arab American Institute and also managing director of Zogby Research Services. He's a lecturer and scholar on Middle East affairs and the author of the book Arab Voices. Dina Girgis is an Egyptian-American attorney who's long been active in the struggle for democracy and human rights in Egypt. Uh, formerly, she was the Keston Family Research Fellow in the Washington Institute for Near East Policies Project Fikra, where, among other things, she was editor of an Arabic-English blog called Fikra Forum, and she's recently back from Egypt. Ambassador Walker is a scholar at the Middle East Institute and is a professor of global politics at Hamilton College. He has served as ambassador to Egypt, Israel, and the United Arab Emirates over a long and distinguished State Department <coughs> career. And finally, Brian Katoulis is a senior fellow at the Center for American Progress, where his work focuses on U.S. Uh, national security policy in the Middle East and South Asia. He's been a consultant on these issues for U.S. numerous U.S. government agencies and is the co-author of the Prosperity Agenda, a book on U.S. national security. He too was recently in Egypt. So I want to thank you all so much for joining us today for this fabulous panel. It's such an honor and a privilege. Before we begin, though, I just want to make uh, one announcement. Uh, today's panel is part of MEI's new Arab Transitions Initiative, an initiative to really shine a spotlight on the historic transformations underway uh, in the Arab world, in the countries where we're seeing political transitions taking place. And I'd like to draw you to our website, our Arab Transitions website, which you can access through mei.edu, where we're featuring uh, quite a variety of uh, Egyptian writers and analysts looking at everything from uh, the latest blasphemy law. We've got a great article by uh, Sand Monkey, uh, a very well-known Egyptian blogger on the blasphemy laws, articles on the late, recent controversial draft NGO law. We have a look at the rivalries inside El Azhar, uh, and a very interesting interview with Ahmed El Darag, the uh, current Minister of Planning in Egypt. So take a look at our website. I hope you enjoy it and tell others about it. Uh, and in the meantime, I think we shall begin. I'd like to invite Mr. Zogby to the stage. Thank you. I have to make a comment about Sand Monkey. I, uh, <laughs> it's, a, uh, it's a useful blog, but in my neighborhood, I was the one Lebanese kid in an all-Italian neighborhood. And Sand Monkey then was fighting words. Um, <laughs> it is indeed politically incorrect. Uh, very politically. And, and talking about blasphemy, I mean, my God, that's coming close. Um, anyway, thank you. Thank you uh, to M Middle East Institute for hosting. Thank you, Wendy. Um, and uh, thank all of you on the panel for, for joining us. And I want to uh, acknowledge Ambassador Yusuf al and Ambassador Art Hughes, a longtime friend, and David Mack, and the rest of you for, for coming. Thank you all very much. I also want to acknowledge my daughter, Sarah Zogby, Sarah Hope Zogby, who's with me today. And Sarah's the one who makes all my work look really good. Um, <laughs> she's our graphic arts designer at Zogby Research. Um, uh, 
one year into the Morsi presidency, uh, we wanted to take a look, as we have done for Presidents Bush and and uh, and Presidents Obama, how to answer the Ed Koch question: How am I doing? Um, and uh, and get a look at public perceptions of of Egypt today in in Egypt, of its, the role of its government, of the performance of its uh, its president. And the picture doesn't come out very good. Um, in fact, if I were to sort of capsulize it, I'd say you have a minority supported president who controls all the levers of power in a deeply dis divided and increasingly frustrated society. Uh, let me start actually by taking a look at the broad landscape of the, the survey that w what we found. We did not ask people whether they belong to political parties. Couldn't really do that because with the exception of the Muslim Brotherhood, almost everything else is new and therefore doesn't have a, a defined membership. So instead we asked the question, what confidence level do you have? Those who had confidence were recorded in a particular camp, but never as supporters, but as people who have confidence in. Three basic groups ended up emerging from this. One were the Islamic tendency groups, which virtually overlap. Those who have confidence in Freedom and Justice Party are almost exactly the same people who have confidence in the, the Noor Party, with a slight overlap <coughs> principally on the side of the, the, the Noor Party. Uh, and you'll see that in somewhat lower numbers that they give the presidency than the Muslim Brotherhood <coughs> crowd. Did. Then there's the, what we call the organized oppositionists, a slightly larger group. Um, it's 1,693. But the overlap there is much smaller with the National Salvation Front and the, uh, the April 6th movement, people who have confidence in both of those, not exactly overlapping as the, the two Islamic uh, parties do. And then finally, the largest, single largest group in the country is what I call the silent disaffected plurality. Um, it's almost 2,000 people, about 40% of the overall survey, and these are people who have confidence in none of the political groups, either the opposition or the, um, the, 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 the religious parties. Um, let's see how this plays out a little bit. First question is the one we ask, uh, we ask in every poll, are you better off than you were five years ago? Um, in America we ask four, but in the rest of the world it doesn't make so much sense to do that. So we asked five. These are the results of previous polls compared with the current one. Uh, in 2009, 39% uh, of all Egyptians said they were better off. Uh, only 24% uh, said worse off, the rest said about the same. In 2011, uh, in the aftermath of Tahrir Square, uh, th the, the number of those who said worse off was greater than those who said they were better off. Um, and then by 2013, in the current polls, 28% say they're better off. 61% now say that they are worse off. Now, I want to look at how that breaks out among the three main political groupings that we had. And this is going to play, it's going to be repetitive in almost every answer to every question that we asked. How, how's your situation today compared to five years ago? Only those in the Freedom Justice Party uh, who identify with Freedom Justice and Noor, who say they have confidence in both of those, are, are, have any sense of being better off at all. 98% for Freedom and Justice, 90% among the National Salvation Front and April 6th movement, and those who are the, 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 the disenfranchised or the, dis, uh, the disaffected plurality, um, it's four, six, and one percent. Um, you're going to find this playing across the board. Only those who say they have confidence in the Muslim Brotherhood are those who have any degree of confidence in the current situation or, or any degree of support uh, for the presidency. Declining legitimacy of the government. Back uh, in, in this poll, we asked the question, when you look back to what your reaction was when he was first elected, um, how did you view it? Um, the lighter colors uh, say that it was a, a positive development. The darker says it was um, a democratic election, and I have to respect the result. Now, if you look at the total column on the left-hand side, back then, 57% overall said it was either a positive victory uh, or it was a democratic election, and I respect the result. Today, uh, they, they look at it now a year later, and they say only 28% have that feeling. 
uh, with 50% now saying it was a setback for the country. But let's look at how it breaks out among the different groups. You can see, obviously, those who have uh, identified with or, or, or have confidence in freedom and justice in the Noor Party, overwhelming majorities either say it was a positive development or uh, it was a democratic election and they had to respect the result. But even among the National Salvation Front, uh, uh, folks who identify or support them, uh, or the April 6th movement, or the silent uh, um, disaffected plurality, you have in the range of 40 plus percent. Back, when they look back at the election, they say, I looked at it as a positive de development, or it was a democratic election and I feel I have to support it. Now, when they say a year later, how do you feel about it? It's 5% of the National Salvation Front folks, 5% of the um, April 6th movement, and only 3% of that 40% group that is the silent, uh, disaffected majority. None of that group said it was a positive development. Three were willing to say it was a democratic election and I have to respect the result. That's what I would call disaffected. Let's look at the confidence they have in Egyptian institutions. The army is the only one that gets overwhelming support from every sector. Uh, and I mean overwhelming support when you're in the 94% range, which is where they are. That means every political group was over 90% uh, in saying that the army was a, an institution they had confidence in. The police was lower at 52, and there was a division there. Uh, with the not everyone being in the, 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 the majority camp among the April 6th and among the the people in the National Salvation Front, it was in the 40% range and that dragged the number down. The judiciary, interestingly enough, also had majority support from every group. Majority support from the Islamic groups, majority support from the opposition groups, and majority support among the disaffected uh, uh, plurality, meaning that this is an institution that regardless of how the presidency is viewing it and wanting to change it, does have like the military, support across the board, although not as great a support. The presidency itself does not have widespread support. Only 27% of all the institutions that we measured in the poll, it had the lowest uh, support base uh, in, the, in the country. And you'll see why. Total was 27% confidence, 71% no confidence. Virtually the only confidence uh, in the presidency comes from those who have confidence as well in the Muslim Brotherhood and Noor parties. 99%, 90% for those two, 3, 4, and 1% among the rest of the country. That's why you end up with a 27% overall rating. It, it would be, if one wants to parallel it, it would be here if during the Bush presidency or now in the Obama presidency, you not only had the red state, blue state, but if independence had swung completely in the direction of the opposition party so that virtually all the president has left is his own group, nobody else. Let's look at satisfaction with the government and the government's uh, performance. In guaranteeing my rights and freedom, Again, it's going to get repetitive. 27%. Creating economic opportunity, 25%. Keeping me safe and maintaining order, 26%. Supporting services that help provide for my family's health care, education, and social needs, 26%. Again, when you play it out among the, the different groups, here's what you get. The only groups satisfied are the Islamic leaning parties or those who identify with them and with the others virtually no satisfaction whatsoever. Going now to the credibility of leaders. Um, I thought it was interesting. Uh, former <coughs> President Sadat, 93% favorable rating across the board. Again, with every group. It was true with uh, it was true with the, the, those in the Islamic camp, it was true with those in the opposition camp, and true with those in the silent, uh, disaffected plurality. Not the case with, incidentally, uh, uh, former President Nasser, who did not get support from, uh, from every, every group across the board. Only Sadat did. Um, President Mubarak at 23%, Morsi at 27%. Ahmed Shafiq, uh, 30, uh, Abdel Fattah at 33. Now, the only living leader who had popular support 
in the majority is Bassem Youssef, <laughs> the comedian. I don't know if he's running for president, uh, but... Uh, um, might think about it. <laughs> he, he might think about it. His numbers looked pretty good. Incidentally, not support among the, 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 those who identify with the Islamic parties, but very strong support among everybody else in the country. 60% favorable ratings, pretty good for almost anybody. Uh, ask the president here, uh, anybody. Let's look at the issue of the Constitution. Um, you're going to see the Constitution is going to play out like everything else with a 30% sub favorable rating, 62% unfavorable, the only support, virtually the only support coming from the Freedom, Justice, and newer folks who identify with, uh, with those groups. Uh, the others, 8, 9, and 8% among the, the folks who identify with the other, the other groups. Um, let's look at a broader sense of how people view the Muslim Brotherhood and the, the current government. Um, can, is it capable of the current government of leading the nation out of economic crisis? 25% say yes. Remember that number when you see a 25-28% in that range, it's going to be the same breakout as everything else. Um, is the Muslim Brotherhood committed to democracy? 28% yes, 72% no. Is the Muslim Brotherhood capable of administering the state? 26% yes. Everybody else, 73% no. The Egyptian opposition is able to offer a better political alternative than the current government. The numbers reverse. 72% yes. 28% no. The Muslim Brotherhood tends to Islamize the state and control its executive powers. 71% yes. 29% no, and I want, I want to get to that one in a minute. Um, upcoming parliamentary elections will be fair and transparent, 29% and 71%. Let's take a, a closer look at, at just one of these to give you a read, which I think is interesting because it's the only one where I present a cross tab here on the religion factor. Committed to democracy, the same breakout across the board, but among Muslims, 30% say that the Muslim Brotherhood is committed to democracy. 70% of Muslims in Egypt say it's not committed to democracy. And 14% of those who identify with the Nur party say it is not committed to democracy. What to do next? We present a number of options. First was scrapping the Constitution. Same breakout as everything else. It's very strong support. Um, but the support comes only from those three major uh, groupings, the National Salvation Front, April 6th, and the, the disaffected plurality. What to do next should the military assume control? Um, again, not support across the board, and, and actually not overwhelming support from uh, the National Salvation Front in April 6th. Majority support, yes, 60, 60, and 59. But a good 40 or so percent still want to see democracy play out before they have the last resort, which would be the military coming back. Um, should there be immediate parliamentary elections? You don't get overwhelming support for this one either. You get very strong support from the Freedom Justice Party and Noor uh, uh, folks who identify with them, um, but you don't get strong support, majority support from the other groups. And remember, 70 plus percent said in the earlier question they didn't think the next election would be fair or or impartial, and therefore there's not consensus on that issue. Um, the only one that gets support across the board is holding a real national dialogue. Although one might wonder, with the divisions being as deep as they are in the country, what might be the outcome of such a, uh, a national dialogue. But it certainly is, in the, it's 87% overall, and anything in the 90% range is going to have strong support among every cross step. Just one final observation. There were some regional differences that we found, to be sure. I mean, uh, you know, if you in the urban centers and the cities, you had one set of numbers. In the rural areas, you had something else. But there were very little other demographic differences that I noticed. Differences of region, uh, but not differences. Very strong differences among educated, among men and women, among young or old, 
Um, and I find that interesting in and of itself. This is not like in the United States where the red state, blue state is purely a demographic phenomenon with young people, educated professional women, uh, blacks, Hispanics, etc. one camp and then white, you know, our, our group, I guess. Um, if I might be so bold as to put myself in the white, white camp. The, uh, um, white older men being on, on the other side, uh, et cetera. That's not the case here. Uh, this was an across the board, uh, same splits with almost all the groups, and I thought that that is something um, worth noting. Finally, I, I, clearly there is a sense here that something is amiss um, and something is, is not working right. Uh, you have a minority group controlling all the levers of power, um, an opposition that has the possibility of mobilizing 70 plus percent of the population but lacking the leadership unless the comedian runs or lacking the ability to draw. They've lost now a, a series of elections being unable to get out the vote in the same way that the that the Brotherhood has. Uh, I don't know what the, what comes up. April, uh, June 30th, May create a new dynamic we just don't know but certainly the situation is quite volatile um, and is ripe for some change um, and I think uh, I leave the the kind of change uh, and the whether or not uh, we'll, we can expect it to the, the rest of the panel to discuss but those are the numbers that we have to date. Right. Thank you very much Jim. It's really a, a remarkable poll that crystallizes in, in number so many, so many of the sentiments that we've been sensing in Egypt this past uh, year, these past few months, especially this growing anxiety about um, the authoritarianism that's emerging from the state. But I, Jim, you've been doing so much polling in the Arab world and in Egypt. Um, now that you're seated here, just spell out what really surprised you about this poll, what, what you sort of took away from it. I think the last point I made about the absence of substantial demographic differences among the groups I thought was really interesting. I had expected, it was the same as one the last poll I did in, in, in Palestine where we found, you know, we know of the deep differences in the politics of Hamas and Fatah. But what we found were no demographic differences among the, among the, two, the two groups. Um, and that's pretty much what, what I saw here. And that did surprise me. It, it, it requires then a different look at, at Egypt. It, doesn't, it means that this is not going to be women in one camp, men in the other, young people in one camp, uh, older people in another, educated people in one camp, less educated in another. It, it means that it's an across-the-board phenomenon. And people's identification with the Brotherhood as a party um, has less to do, in other words, with their demographic or their status right. uh, than it does to do with an ideological orientation. And so this is an ideological split, not a demographic graphic split. Right. That, that to me was intriguing. And so extreme when you've got 95% yeah. of Islamists supporting Morsi and 95% of the opposition against him. I mean this is a gap that's... This is red state, blue state, state writ large. Right. Sort of yeah. Beyond the usual. This makes state. creating unity in Congress easy. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. These are divisions we've never seen right. recently. Right. What else struck you? Uh, I, I think that you know the, the, the looking back a year and looking forward a year when the support base collapses to that degree in that short period of time means that the overreach is not well not well received right. um, and when it's when the only support you have is limited to folks who identify with your party and no one else I mean a three a two a one or a zero uh, among the that 40 percent swatch of people which is a very large group incident when that started to emerge for me uh, and I, and I, that was a, it was another way of looking at it. We did the confidence in the parties, and then all of a sudden I said, wait a minute, what about everybody else? And I found f almost 40% confidence in none of the parties. That, I think, to me was also quite intriguing. I, or certainly an early stage in democratic development, party system is new, but that's a lot of people to have no confidence in anybody, and yet have views identical to the two parties. Why haven't the two parties been able to reach out to organize them? Or, or to, This is not a question of membership, it's a question of confidence. They have no confidence in the leadership of the National Salvation Front. No confidence in the leadership of April 6th. What's wrong with that picture? 
Uh, there clearly is a need for broader organization, but that will require a need for a different kind of leadership to emerge, and that's what we haven't seen yet. The situation is ripe all the way around for change, but there's going to be some elements that are needed to make that, <coughs> that change occur to create the confidence that it's, it's real. Right. Well, I want to talk a little bit more about the current leadership um, with Dina and, and, and Ned. Um, these numbers, Morsi's numbers are, are very interesting. The 28% popularity down from 57% uh, a year ago. Dina, you spent the last year um, in Egypt. How do the numbers in this poll either confirm or contradict what you sensed? And more specifically, what's the real significance of these Morsi numbers and how do they reflect on the standing of the Muslim Brotherhood and its, its sort of standing in Egyptian society today, a year into Morsi's leadership? Mm -hmm. Um, well, I think um, actually that the poll results track very much with my sense of things on the ground. Um, it is sobering to see it in numbers. Um, can everyone hear me? Everyone hear me okay? It's sobering to see the numbers um, because the numbers are quite staggering and really do illustrate that um, the Muslim Brotherhood um, sort of based or Islamist based presidency really has um, almost zero support I think as Jim mentioned uh, among any contingency apart from its own electorate um, which is quite alarming. Um, you know, Morsi was elected um, to many people, especially among sort of the young revolutionary contingency, as sort of a protest vote, um, largely as a result of the other candidates being so bad, if you will, the other candidates being so far away from the revolutionary aspirations. Um, you know, the other big candidate was Ahmed Shafi, who, of course, was, you know, a former Mubarak minister, um, really quite, you know, came across as very out of touch um, with, with the public at large. Um, we had, uh, you know, Hamdin Sabah who was, you know, associated with, with uh, Nasserist and, and, and nationalist movement, um, you know, to some people a little bit out of touch with the times and also not terribly well known, although he has, you know, some credibility as, as you know, sort of a bona fide um, opposition leader. Um, but really, I think that um, Morsi's presenting himself as, you know, the, the president for all Egyptians, and that was very much emphasized, and controversial topics during the campaign such as the status of women under a Muslim Brotherhood-led government, the status of minorities, um, were really sort of sidelined or, um, uh, you know, sort of glossed over in very abstract terms. Um, Morsi did say that he believes in full equality. He actually pledged to uh, appoint either a Christian or a woman as vice president. That never happened. Um, and so a lot of the, the young revolutionaries at first, um, as had been the tendency during the Mubarak year, is that the Muslim Brotherhood capitalized on so much disillusionment with the Mubarak regime as the only organized opposition th that was there, they gained the support of the people simply out of protest. So I think that that carried on post-revolution and um, the revolutionaries were advocating for Morsi simply because they thought that he was uh, the best of the worst, if you will, in terms of, of furthering um, revolutionary aspirations. Now, what has happened since then is that Morsi has taken um, so many steps to alienate precisely that group of people, the young revolutionaries, the media personalities that brought him into power. We saw, um, you know, attacks on peaceful protests. We saw the very bungled constitutional drafting process where literally um, every single non-Islamist element was alienated from the process and we had sort of what became a mockery of any constitution writing process in that it was voted on in the middle of the night. Um, nobody really knew what was going on. And so it, it sort of increasingly became clear that Morsi was not, in fact, a president for all Egyptians and that he was very much catering to his own people. Then came the Ittihadeya clashes or um, the clashes at the presidential palace. Um, after Morsi declared himself above the law, um, he, he did away with the judicial review of his decisions, basically and um, appointed a new prosecutor general who was seen as, as very um, malleable um, to the president and highly politicized. And so, um, again, we saw the presidential palace. In the presidential palace clashes, we saw specifically, not necessarily the police or state institutions coming out against the protesters, but specifically members of the Islamist camp. And we saw leaders from the Freedom and Justice Party, like Hassam al-Aryan, take to Twitter and call upon followers 
go to the presidential palace, um, you know, and put these people in, in their place. And now today, this growing then frustration with this attitude and behavior on the part of Morsi, I mean, how is that translating into views of the Muslim Brotherhood of the party in, in general? I mean, More broadly, I think that, um, as, as Jim mentioned, I think that the differences are ideological. It's interesting that, you know, there isn't much of a difference um, between, you know, sort of Coptic views and, and Muslim views. Um, I think that there is a, a, a general sort of disenchantment with this idea of imposing an, a specific ideology and view of what role religion should play in the new Egypt. Um, I think that's a concern that many Muslims that are not affiliated with Islamist groups have. Um, I also think that there is um, quite a degree of cynicism now about, you know, people that align themselves with godliness and religiosity essentially coming into power and really, um, you know, staking a claim to sort of all the levers of power legislatively and in the executive sort of um, systematically alienating others that don't share their views. And so um, it's increasingly coming across as, as a Machiavellian movement, I think. And um, interesting that um, <clears throat> the sort of silent majority that, uh, that Jim was talking about, this is a very interesting group because this is a group that um, shows almost as much disillusionment with the organized opposition as it does with, um, with the Islamists. And this is very concerning and actually quite startling, but, um, but it's also no surprise. A lot of the organized opposition um, has institutionalized itself in the very feckless um, and, and sort of selfish way that the opposition, the liberal opposition under Mubarak had as well. You've now, you're now seeing parties, the National Salvation Front, consisting of older people, people that are not very representative of sort of the young vibe of the revolution. Um, you're seeing a lot of, uh, of egos, um, you're seeing a lot of people um, run things internally in an undemocratic manner. Um, they are really not tapping into um, the, the needs. They're not responding to the needs of the people after the revolution. Um, they're really representing more of the old guard. And so what we have now, what I feel the movement that has emerged, and, and perhaps the poll was not able to, to capture that because it really started happening probably um, a little bit later than the poll was concluded, is a new movement called Tamarud, or Rebel. And um, in, in my view, that movement is really tapping into and resonating with that silent majority precisely because it's avoiding the pitfalls that the organized opposition has. So, and, and we can get into the details later. Yeah. Thank you. Ned, so little trust in the Morsi leadership, and yet uh, so much at stake in Egypt, so many challenges ahead from tying up this IMF deal to dealing with a, a new crisis with Ethiopia relating to the, the waters of the, the Nile. You've covered Egypt for years. You've followed it closely. What do you see as the major challenges, and what are your concerns about the lack of capacity that this particular leadership has to deal with these issues? Well, I'm not sure the, uh, this leadership lacks the capacity, depending on the issue. Um, you remember that in Jim's uh, evaluation of the various factions in uh, Egypt that the army came out uh, really well. Uh, the army has a major element, major interest in the Nile water. Uh, when I used to talk to uh, general officers in Egypt uh, about the question, what would you do if uh, the Ethiopians cut off the Nile, we would go in with your airplanes and we would change the situation. And they were serious and I believe they would still take that attitude. So on the point of the Nile waters, it's a huge problem, could get a, to a regional war, uh, but uh, there's no doubt in my mind where the Egyptians will come out on that and it has nothing to do with Morsi. And Morsi will of course follow along with the army. He has a the devil's agreement, if you will, with the armed forces at this point. Uh, so that's one of the problems that they face. They face a horrendous problem in the division of the country uh, between those that support the uh, Salafis, those that support the Muslim Brotherhood, and basically the rest of, them, of, the, uh, of the country, as Jim has pointed out. Uh, but be very wary of uh, identifying the, the, the I love that term from my past, silent majority. Um, silent majorities are very uh, 
difficult to evaluate. Silent majority can mean that they're just keeping their powder dry or it can mean that they simply don't care and they won't go out to vote and they won't get involved. And we don't know what that silent majority means uh, in Egypt. Uh, so I'm um, a little bit concerned about uh, putting too much weight on that side of the equation, although certainly you can't dismiss it. Um, I have a fairly pessimistic view of where things are going and uh, part of this is uh, coming from some of my friends in Egypt who are one is a former American citizen now back to Egypt uh, in business others uh, are in the same idea but I have this uh, uh, email from uh, a friend of mine uh, who put this succinctly this question succinctly now you saw how uh, the division of the population came out with a substantial minority uh, advocating an Islamic trend and ten or tendency. Uh, but it was a committed, and as Jim said, an ideological minority. And ideology often trumps rationality. Uh, when you come right down to it. So this guy writes, average Egyptians can easily visualize an Islamic religious Sharia state like the one every child learned about in school, a glorious civilization built on Islamic values. Few can understand what it means to be, a, to be pro a secular democratic state other than as a path to bring immoral, immoral and decadent like West. Uh, and then he goes on to say that the future of Egypt will depend on whether anybody can bring a perspective that gives some kind of equivalent uh, identification for, for Egyptians, uh, a, a reason for supporting somebody else. And right now they don't have it. Uh, the buzz, Mubarak, the main street liberal secular parties are against many things. They're against Mubarak, corruption, Muslim Brotherhood. They're difficult to visualize because they don't have a consistent, coherent view, vision of what Egypt, and that's what these people in Egypt seem to think is missing from the current political structure. Um, so when you look at those graphs uh, and you see that the Salafis and the Muslim Brotherhood are together, uh, and then you see this disparate 20 different little parties uh, t claiming to represent democracy in the future um, and you then look at what how how are elections how are elections decided in this country and I think probably in Egypt too elections are decided by a bunch of very committed people who go out and they're willing to do the polling they're going to get out in the street they're going to work very hard for their candidate. I see that as being a possible uh, approach of the Salafis and the Muslim Brotherhood. Even though in the final analysis they don't really agree with each other. They will be able to get their people out. They will be able to get them to vote. The other thing that I see in this country is who has the money? Who has the money? And when it comes right down to it, uh, we're not allowed to support any of the political parties, so our money doesn't go to any of the democracy uh, movements. Uh, who is supporting uh, the Salafis? Well, the Saudis are. They've got very deep pockets, okay? Who's supporting the Muslim Brotherhood? The Qataris, they've got big pockets, deep pockets. And who's supporting the democracy movement? I don't know. I don't know. So, right now, the system is heavily tilted against what we, I think, in America believe in, and what I think we also believe is the best thing in the future for the Egyptians. But it's not up to us to tell them. That's something they're going to have to come to conclude on their own, and um, let's hope they can do so in a reasonable period of time. Well, that leads us to the question of the opposition. You touched upon them, Ned, um, their lack of funding. I want to ask you, Brian, um, to talk a little bit about the opposition. The poll showed, as Jim mentioned, absolutely no uh, support for opposition leaders. Baradai uh, received an 81% unfavorable uh, rating. Amr Musa also did very poorly. Maybe shed more light on the opposition landscape right now. 
Um, what opportunities have they squandered? I mean, as Morsi's popularity shrinks, you'd think theirs would be on the rise, but we right. don't see that happening. So Great. talk to us about that. Well, thanks for having me here. And um, I want to congratulate you on and the Middle East Institute on the Arab Transitions Initiative. I actually think it's aptly titled. Um, I just wanted to state that because Arab Awakening or Arab Spring or Islamist Winter, we should throw all these labels out. What we're dealing with two and a half years into uh, these transitions in Egypt and in other places will be going on for years and they're complicated and the polls that Jim does and the analysis that Dina, it's great to meet you for the first time, um, do help, helps us understand something that we don't know what we don't know about what's going on here and I think it's uh, terribly important. The way I read the poll and to your question of the opposition on the optimistic side is that this is an open field. There's open space mm -hmm. that the market of politics in Egypt work uh, at the popular level if that market is kept free and open. And that's, that's the big if. And my big worry right now, uh, as Dina had mentioned and many people have analyzed, is what I think we've seen over the last uh, seven or eight months is a power grab. And we see it a slow creep power grab, but trying to set and dictate the terms of reference for how Egypt negotiates its future, and de debates its future. And that's the big worry, it should worry all Americans and everybody around the world that Egypt could sink in this political legitimacy crisis. And it's not just a political legitimacy crisis to your question about Morsi and the Ikhwan and the current powers that be. It is a political legitimacy crisis amongst those elites, uh, those who have been in opposition for decades, the new forces. And you, you mentioned so the, new, the new popular movement that sprung up and we'll see what happens. I, I don't think anybody has an accurate prediction here, but these spring up when they're not satisfied by the market leaders, if you will, to use my analogy from economics, that there's a dysfunction that has set in at this point. And the one thing I wanted to say, because everyone from Jim on down has used this phrase ideological, that the division is ideological. And I was in Egypt last month for about a week or so, I worked there uh, now for almost 20 years. There's not much depth to that ideology. There's actually thinking in terms of Islamism, um, and I think the slogan, Islam the Solution, maybe the Muslim Brotherhood has developed a little bit further when it comes to governing and taking care of its people, um, and mostly concerned about its own people, but there's not much depth there. And I think you asked about money first. I think the thing that's lacking right now uh, in the discussions I had in Cairo with many of the political opposition leadership is a clear ideology, a clear vision that is compelling to most ordinary Egyptians. Going back to my first sort of point, this is an open field. There isn't a well thought out, how are we going to connect this to the problems of ordinary people? What I see potentially, uh, the downside here, is uh, another round of elite jockeying for power. And I think the big danger is, do, do the elites uh, in the next round of protests, if they occur later this month, does this lead to more violence and, and, and other things? But does this also lead to more disengagement from ordinary Egyptians who really have not uh, been approached and connected by the non-Islamist forces in a big way? So I, I'd close off sort of the first comment in that they've not seized the opportunity. And even if people from the outside, whether it's countries in the region or the US or others, figured out ways to get money in to support these opposition groups, I don't know if I'd invest in them. Mm. Because sitting down with them, in terms of what is your solution to addressing the economic crisis? What is your solution in terms of will you back the US and other countries in regional security issues? All of these big ticket items, I don't have a clear answer and I think the Egyptian people themselves who are concerned about jobs and other things don't have a clear answer mm -hmm. too. So I think the real question isn't who's going to fund them, it's whether they're going to actually seize this opportunity to offer a con contrasting idea. And isn't that what the Tamarid movement represents, this rejection of the elite opposition in an attempt to do kind of a more grassroots organizing? The Tamarid movement, for those who don't know, um, it's called the rebel movement. It's a, a grassroots movement that has collected about 7 to 10 million signatures online calling for Morsi's resignation. Uh, and they're going to be holding a big protest on June 30th and marching to the presidential palace. So I'd just be curious, Brian and maybe Dina, to weigh in on the significance of the Tamarid movement well, in this we, context. Well, we don't know yet. We don't know whether this is going to be another kafaya, and quite frankly, my, my worry is, and I come from the center left in our spectrum <coughs> here, um, my worry is it smells a little like a move on type organization, that it's channeling energy 
but if it doesn't concretely offer uh, an agenda. And this is where it's a call to leadership that, that I think is, is missing. Mm -hmm. Maybe it'll shake things up. I think certainly these sorts of movements, and this is the latest iteration of it, has uh, led to the decreased legitimacy of the established order. But the question, the thing that's been missing, has been, has anyone come along that has offered a compelling vision that fits with what, uh, what with, with most, most Egyptians want. I mean, just one anecdote, when I was in Cairo, I spoke with one of the leading opposition figures, and he had a very thoughtful critique about what was going on in the region and why Secretary Kerry was going to fail on the Middle East peace process because it was all about conferences and process rather than substance. But when I asked this leader, what, what are you guys going to do about the economy? In Egypt, he said, "We're going to have a conference, and we're going to we're going to bring people together uh, and talk about. We're going to bring a couple dozen nations together to talk." And, and there was no clear idea uh, uh, in terms of policy ideas connected to an ideological vision. So, and I don't know that this movement is going to actually provide that. I think it's providing opposition and and, and channeling that dissent against Morsi, and that's a good thing. But it only goes as far as it goes, I think. I mean, if I could just add to that, in defense of the organized opposition, which is really not a position that I'd like to take because God knows that, there, I mean, the flaws are just, you know, too many to name. But you also have to think about the, challenge, the channels available to the opposition right now in Egypt. So many have been closed definitively. When we talk about contesting on a fair sort of um, playing field, whether it be on elections or whether it be on informing laws, um, how can you, when you have a new electoral draft law that um, a new electoral law which has been proposed which is um, extremely biased or clearly in favor of one group and because the legislature is dominated by uh, the Islamist contingency you really don't have civil society or the opposition weighing in on how things should go. Um, I think uh, that the opposition has done a poor job of proposing their own alternatives certainly and selling their own political platforms. That, that, that's certainly true and I think that it's going to take time and it's going going to take them really waking up um, to what Egypt requires and what Egypt responds to. But at the same time, there have been attempts. For instance, when we talk about the recent NGO law, um, many of you have followed the, the NGO um, verdict uh, in which you know, 16 Americans were, were sentenced to prison terms in Egypt. Um, well, uh, the opposition and civil society have been trying to weigh in on a much more progressive civil society law. Civil society, mind you, is this sector that was really instrumental in catalyzing the revolution and now is really critical in, in ensuring sort of that you know the revolution achieves its goals. So this law is critical for Egypt's future. Um, not only have the opposition and civil society attempted to um, um, really inform the process of this new law and even bring in international experts um, including you know the Americans, the Europeans, everyone else, but they've actually drafted their own alternative law which was completely ignored with a thank you very much received from the presidency. Absolutely none of it reflected in the final draft law. Um, and so, you know, that's just in defense of, of the organized opposition, just slightly. Um, but, but, you know, you're, you're absolutely right in that, you know, there, there's a huge learning curve and they really need to step up to the plate and they really have, have not done so in any meaningful way. Um, when it comes to Tamarud, Tamarud is actually, um, has, has done, has done quite a bit just because um, this this idea of, of a grassroots leaderless movement um, very much mirrors sort of the lead up to the revolution. The revolution I think was so compelling to Egyptians because it broke away from the you know one man show mentality that Egypt has been under for so long. Um, I think the fact that after the revolution, um, these disparate elements were not able to come together. That has been a huge sort of stumbling block in terms of how do we channel this revolutionary ardor and our aspirations and the values that we're fighting for in sort of organized political fashion. So it has been a pitfall, but which Tamarud has so far avoided. Now, in terms of how they're going to channel these 15 million petitions to, to call for early presidential elections and to withdraw confidence from the president, that's a 
great question. Lately, um, they have been meeting with members from the judiciary to try to examine, um, are there areas in the law, are there areas in the Constitution that would allow us to translate sort of this, this vast popular sentiment? Mind you, 15 million signatures in a country of, you know, 80-some million, that's significant. significant. Um, and so they are look, really looking to do that. It's a movement that's quite authentically grassroots so far. There have been no new egos coming out to claim leadership of, of the movement, which is fantastic. Really, their support lies from people voluntarily taking it upon themselves to get petitions and get their friends and family to sign on. You know, on Facebook, you see all the time people at, you know, a couple at their wedding while they're getting married, having their guests, you know, sign on to these, these petitions. So there is something there. They've captured a sentiment that is really there that just doesn't know how to channel its energy. They need to learn from the mistakes of the organized opposition. They need to have a strategy moving forward because in my view, if early presidential elections were to be held within the next few months, it is quite likely that the most organized opposition group, i.e. the Muslim Brotherhood, will have the advantage again. And so what have we achieved? And Jim, you asked Egyptians about next steps. You didn't mention, you know, do you want to march on the presidential palace? But you asked them, you know, do you want to um, hold a national dialogue to achieve consensus? Do you want the military to intervene? Uh, and it was interesting, most people sought national dialogue. Um, yeah. Talk to me about that, if that struck you as realistic and how you could see national dialogue going forward in a country so polarized. Yeah, I didn't see it as realistic. I mean, I, I think what it, what it was was more of a statement of a call for respect of diverse points of views, a sense that Egyptians want um, their society to evolve in a peaceful way, not in a confrontational way. That, that, when, when you get numbers that large from every camp saying it, the question is, will the quote-unquote presidency um, accept that? And, uh, and the efforts at dialogue to date right. have been rather constrained and defined and therefore haven't worked. Um, and, and does, and I want to go back to Brian's point, does, does the opposition have the people who <coughs> have the respect of the 70 plus percent able to sit down in that national dialogue and participate because the I, I thought Brian's points were, were, were quite well taken and you know millions of petitions are great and indicate a level of organization but at the end of the day there is an absolute demand for leadership elections aren't won by movements they're won by by persons and um, Barack Obama was able to translate that massive public mood for change into a, a vision one can argue about the implementation of the vision, et cetera, but the point is, if it weren't for him being able to crystallize it and give it voice, he wouldn't have won that election and wouldn't have beat Hillary Clinton at, at the same time. I mean, he beat the most significant candidate that was out there. Um, question is, who comes forward to provide that leadership? Who comes forward to provide that vision? And vision is what's what's absent from, from the leadership. And I again want to point to Brian's thing. I think that the, the, the problem is that we, the Arab world's been in crisis now in, in that North African Levant region for, for, for decades. This isn't new. Um, and while the Islamic parties had a vision, and it was a vision of going back, nobody had a vision of going forward. And even where you had in Tunisia, you know, the, the government uh, claiming a vision, or at least only on the rudiments of a vision, uh, women's empowerment and civil society, all of those things, it was never translated into a compelling enough vision to draw people to it. And so you had the compelling vision of going back to when men were men, women were women, and all was pure, versus the, I don't know where I'm going right now, other than supporting this guy who's in office and has the power and, and just one final point maybe to, to sort of shift for. I was just in the Middle East and one comment came up twice. And because it came up twice and in the way that it came up, I just want to, um, two guys, Egyptians both, working in the hotel where I stayed at different times came up to me and said, why is Obama supporting the Brotherhood? Mm -hmm. okay, well, and I said, well, he's not really. And I did my best to my way through it. Try to put that in a transcript. Um, and, um, and then both of them, in a rather defiant way, walked away shaking their fingers saying, wait till June 30th. <laughs> now, what came through in both instances was this total sense of confusion about where America is. Right. 
or isn't. Mm -hmm. And the fact that the signs have all been given that we do support. But on the other hand, this yeah. hope may be unrealistic expectation and hope that June 30th is somehow going to be a transformational moment. And, and I think both of those are kind of worthy of consideration at this point. How does the administration make itself clearer? Uh, or does it just be quiet at this point if it can't be clearer? And secondly, what's going to be needed to make June 30th significant? Because one of the numbers that came through that I didn't mention was we asked um, on that favorable, no, not favorable, positive development, uh, setback, et cetera. Among the Freedom Justice, um, among the, I'm sorry, the National Salvation Front, the April 6th and the silent uh, disaffected plurality, whatever we're calling it, 68% said it was now a setback. They looked at the Morsi victory as a setback. 28% said nothing will change in Egypt. That's real disaffected. And I think that's the, that's the group that I worry about most. If that number grows, then you have a situation where the small, very committed, organized, disciplined yeah. mm -hmm. Islamic party takes control and, and, and they end up with a passive acceptance of it by the, by the rest who say nothing's going to change because the opposition's got nothing to offer. Let me turn to the yeah. former U.S. ambassador to Egypt to ask him to comment on the view of uh, the Obama administration's posi position on Egypt. Should it be reconsidered? And if so, in what way? What's your view of how they're uh, handling this? You say, well, I have a feeling that the Obama administration's position on Egypt has virtually nothing to do with the position of the Egyptians on Egypt's future. <laughs> uh, there are certainly some who would very much like to have us come out in favor of democracy and so on, which we pretend to be in support of uh, most of the time. Uh, but uh, it is not clear to me that uh, it's going to have a profound impact in Egypt if Obama comes out and says, in fact, in some senses it may reinforce the opinion of people that support the Salafis and the Brotherhood and so on, these outsiders, these Westerners, these anti-religious uh, people coming out in favor of something that, uh, you know, it, you've got to support us, therefore. Like I'm, I'm really worried about Egypt's future, partly because you know I think it's great that they have the 15,000 signatures and so on. All of that's taking time. All of that's taking time while Morsi and the Brotherhood and the Salafis are solidifying their position in the country. They've just appointed uh, seven governors. You know, in Egypt, governors are a big deal. Uh, they pretty much control what goes on, particularly the political life of the local governor. You've got seven of them now from the Muslim Brotherhood. You have one, incredibly, from Luxor, tourists coming out of the Gama al-Islami, if you will recall, the Gama is the organization that assassinated Sadat. Uh, not a great friend of the West. Uh, so you're gradually, the Brotherhood is ins inserting itself in every single institution in the country. Three years from now, we're not going to recognize Egypt unless something serious happens to change the equation. Now maybe... And you don't think the U.S. can change its approach and in any way affect... Well, no, look, the U.S., the we should stand for what we stand for, but we've got to be standing for it everywhere. You can't stand for mm -hmm. uh, free and open elections and accepting it in Egypt and not accept it in Gaza. I just say, when, when we were in, when you say not recognize it, when we were in Egypt, uh, in, in UAE two years ago, I was teaching at a, a, a American, uh, at the campus for NYU in Abu Dhabi, just a, a January term class. And it was at the time the parliament was being seated. And my wife and I would be watching television at, at night, and half the channels were channels playing old Egyptian movies. And the other half the channels were news channels, and they were playing the seating of the parliament. And my wife looked at it at one point and she said, how did we get from here to there? She said, don't societies go this way? Yeah. They're going that way. And, it, and I got her That's point, you know? Yeah. It was these hilarious comedies, these wonderful noir films, these, you know, this incredible display of artistic and, 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 and creative talent. And then all of a sudden these dour-faced guys um, taken over, and all guys, incidentally, They're all taken over 
got government, and it was like I'm all it's for going it. backwards. <laughs> <laughs> and I think okay. I think there's a point there about not recognizing it at some point in the not too distant future. I agree. Yeah. yeah, if I could say, I mean, and I respect the ambassador's view, and we we worked together last year on a commission that uh, Steve Hadley and John Podesta co-chaired on Egypt um, with USIP that we did that uh, produced private recommendations, and it was phenomenal. I I think that it could matter a lot more if the U.S. had a less passive stance than it's had over the last two and a half years. I agree with you on the blowback part of it in Egypt. Um, I may disagree slightly in terms of your point on Gaza and the rest of the region because I think there's no one-size-fits-all approach to the transitions no. in Egypt. And, but but I, that's consistency is useful. Yeah, yeah. consistency <laughs> is useful, um, but I don't think you, you could um, accuse the administration of hypocrisy because they no. haven't stated no. that they, they have the same standard that they're applying to Bahrain, certainly, that they are to Tunisia and, and in other places. But I, I think, going to the point of U.S. policy, uh, Egypt has changed tremendously. That's what we all agree on on this pan policy here, uh, on this panel here. Egypt has tr changed a lot. U.S. policy is largely the same. Right. It, it, yeah. The status quo. If you and I'm a policy analyst, if you look at the main tools of what the U.S. does to engage Egypt. There have been some slight shifts, a new enterprise fund, an offer of new types of loan guarantees, but the full package of what we use to engage Egypt uh, is essentially the same as it's been for decades. And making that observation, don't take that to mean that I think we should completely cut aid or, or overhaul it overnight. I've, I've advocated for uh, at least a strategic review which I think has not happened in the two and a half years inside of uh, the, the U.S. government. 20 years. Uh, well, there you go. You were inside. Because, you, you, and you probably know this, is having served as ambassador, the path dependencies of policy, mm -hmm. the way we've done business forever, uh, it, it impedes all sorts of critical thinking and new ideas sure. when it comes to how do we engage. So the, you know, the top line criticism, we've re replaced a Mubarak engagement model with a Muslim Brotherhood engagement right. Right. model, is largely correct, but that's not for a lack of good ideas that people inside of the administration and outside of the administration were proposing to try to think of ways that we might engage a new Egypt and, and, and matter more. Even with these latest NGO difficulties, I think smart, creative people could actually help Egyptians help themselves. Again, if you go back to my analogy of a market, and this is a political market as opposed to an economic market, there's certain dysfunctionalities, and the latest one is that the Muslim Brotherhood seems to be wanting to close off the opportunity for open competition there. There are ways that we can work with other uh, uh, leaders in the world, uh, Europe, other countries in the region, but we don't seem to have, uh, let alone an Egypt strategy that's updated to the times, but a broader regional strategy. Uh, and I get why it's hard to do. Hey, my friends, some of my friends in there, it's reactive, it's tactical, it's crisis management driven. But that's why I think your initiative, what all the think tanks are trying to do, is important to push this administration to think longer term. Where is it all heading? And that's where I, I, I'm, I'm a slightly less passive in terms of I think the U.S. voice could matter if it's, if it's out there with others. Mm -hmm. uh, because I think it could resonate with Egyptians when I lived in Egypt uh, 15, 20 years ago. You know, I, and when I go back regularly, people are still wondering, where is, where is America on this? And, and we are a right frame of reference. Look, I, I, I couldn't agree with you more, but you have to put your money where your mouth is. Yeah. And if you're going to go that direction, if you're going to be an advocate for democracy and so on, it means you have certain consequences uh -huh. of that, yeah. not just in Egypt, but in the region as a whole. And I'm all for it. I think this is what we should be doing. But you've got to make the decision that you're going to be 100% behind that movement. The president has to be behind it. You can't have people coming out of the Pentagon saying something quite different. Uh -huh. And that has been one of the splits in the U.S. government because our military is very closely associated with the Egyptian and many of the countries out there for, for good Dina, reasons. Yeah. yeah, Dina's shaking, uh, nodding her head. Do you agree yeah, with? I, I, I just wanted to, on just in conclusion on on the Tamaro issue, June thirtieth is is not going to be an Armageddon. I'm I'm <laughs> I'm not one of these people that thinks that. But I also will advise and say that you know. The American public has done it before, specifically the American government, which is to underestimate the yeah. potential reach of mass popular uprisings in the region, particularly, particularly in a country like Egypt, which was viewed as, and with good reason, as very stagnant politically, almost going you know, back just this ancient kind of relic that doesn't change. For 60 years, we've been like this, and within you know, 18 days, the situation turned. 
Um, with regards to the United States, I'm just going to speak sort of, you know, in discussion with some of my activist friends back home, and I'll tell you what some of the, the I, I'm going to try to convey what some of the thoughts are. Um, we are constantly having it, you know, sort of shoved back in our faces that the Morsi government, much as you may not like him, is the democratically elected president. Yeah. However, the Egyptian population, when the president goes out and declares himself immune from any kind of judicial review, the Egyptian people with good reason go out and say, wait a second, the president, when he swore an oath, he swore an oath to uphold the laws of this country, including himself. Now he's placed himself above that. Doesn't that call into question his legitimacy as the president? This is the part that people on the ground say, you know, look at what is actually happening on the ground. Do not go by specious democratic processes. Just because you say you're having an election, just because you say you're having national dialogue and you have this great photo op, which turns out to be, you know, Morsi having a national national dialogue with other Islamist forces and absolutely nobody from the opposition, don't take that at face value. When, you know, people in Egypt now after the revolution, they're not going to be satisfied with these hollow processes. We want substance. We want democracy institutionalized. Um, so, so always look at that, at, at the substance of what's happening. And, you know, the, the U.S. government is, is, is quite terrible, frankly, at, you know, reading the situation as it is, as opposed to supporting democratic processes, because the Muslim Brotherhood is very very good at, very adept at going through these processes, which ultimately, uh, you know, are, are not fair or democratic at all in substance. Um, as far as U.S. interests aligning with, with the Muslim Brotherhood government, um, I think Brian is, is quite correct that there has been um, pretty much business as usual in terms of we've gone from one strong man to the next strong man. Morsi, at the beginning of, the, of his presidency specifically, did quite a decent job in terms of brokering um, the Gaza deal. Um, the Muslim Brotherhood is very client when it comes to sort of U.S. military interests in the region. Um, you know, the, the Syria news is big news. Um, now the, the, you know, Egyptian president is calling upon, or, or rather not the Egyptian president, but his aide has gone out in public calling upon e e Egyptians to engage in jihad in Syria and saying that if you do so, you will not be prosecuted upon your return in, 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 in Egypt. But let's try to look at this beyond electoral terms, which is how the U.S. government really functions. Ultimately, it's an idea ideology that really feeds upon anti-Western sentiment, ultimately. Um, we, it, it's not very PC to say that, but when the Libyan embassy was being attacked and when the Egyptian embassy was also under attack, Muslim Brotherhood supporters were tweeting, um, inciting against, against the U.S. government. So let's take that into account. You know, is this the kind of society that is, you know, beneficial to our interests 10 years from now, um, what kind of ideology is being built? Furthermore, if Egypt continues to be rocked by so much instability, are we really able to project any kind of meaningful regional power or international power or cooperation? Not terribly. Um, you know, the, the extent to which we are going to be able to assist the U.S. is, is going to be very limited. Um, Okay, I'll leave it at that. Wanted to comment, just, and we're just, going to open to questions. Just two quick points. One is that um, it, we know the Egyptian economy is in, in crisis. The worst numbers in the poll come in the tourist areas. Uh, if there were a demographic at all, it's it's the people in Luxor, the people in the uh, in Al Arish, etc., are the ones who feel the most strongly about this government. Um, and the appointment of a new governor in Luxor is not going to help that situation or help the Egyptian economy. Um, given the worsening state of the economy, the IMF becomes critical at this point, but can this government, does it have the legitimacy, given its narrowing base, to make the kinds of reforms that are necessary with public support to get the, the IMF uh, on board? And, and that's, um, th that's going to be a, a big one. And, 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 and just finally, the um, this, this, I come back to this issue of vision. It's, it's, it's really absent. I mean, uh, in the in the in the broader region, I mean, where's where is vision? Uh, you've got it in 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 UAE. You've got a vision in Qatar. Uh, you have a sense. People say it's interesting in the polling we do, in, whether it's in Iraq or in in Iran or in Turkey or wherever. Say, what, what do you want your country to be like? They'll point to those two mm. because there's like it's obviously they have wealth. But they also have, they're projecting a way of looking forward and doing something. The, the, the Dubai 2020 Expo logo mm. uh, about bringing people together, partnerships, and stuff. that makes sense to people. 
what's the vision that's emerged so far from Arab Spring? And I, I, one of the polls I'd like to do is we polled back in 2011 and asked people what they thought about it in the broader region. And people gave us, you know, it was like hope. They saw Egypt as a, it was Broadway. It was the, it, the big time. And it's, I wonder what they're saying now. And what are they saying now after Taksim in, in, in Turkey? I mean, where's the, where's the model? Where's the model of a big democracy that works? Is it, 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 it you know, Iran, that ship left. That, that's, that's, that's gone. That's Syria so was the, the nail in the coffin. Turkey is now having its problems. Right. So Egypt no is clearly yeah. having its problems. And so the, the, the Broadway plays flopping. And, and I think that that's the big issue here, right. is not just how it impacts Egypt, but how the absence of vision, the absence of a system that works, how it impacts the broader region in terms of the prospects for change and what kind of change. The region needs a vision and leadership, not just the, not just Egypt. Egypt. Yeah, well, let's hope that vision is out there percolating. Um, I'd like to open the floor to questions and bring other people into the discussion. Uh, Mr. Kimmett here, and I think I'll take uh, two or three questions at once and... Uh, I hate this system. Yeah, that's the first question. Uh, first of all, thanks very much for the, uh, for the outstanding survey. I think you did a great thanks. job on it, Jim. Uh, so let's now take this group and put them in front of the House Foreign Affairs Committee as they are debating the question of economic support funds and the uh, FMF fundings that are probably the most tangible expression of the mm. American support given on a year-to-year -year basis. Given the implications of what this poll says and the observations of what you're seeing, um, and keeping the Hippocratic oath in mind of, above all, do no harm, uh, what would your recommendation to the HFAC be for the FMF and for the ESF numbers, which will probably be some of the most significant inflows for the Egyptian economy, short of what the IMF is going to be providing? A oh, great question. Um, I'll have you, Ryan, answer, but let's just take three, two, two others. There's a gentleman here in the front. Mohammed Shina, Voice of America. With Muslim Brotherhood consolidating its power and ineffective opposition in Egypt and a rebellion coming soon, what could be the end result scenarios in Egypt and what could the U.S. do if June 30th became January 25th? Okay, maybe Ned, you could take that one. Did you understand that? No, I think you'll have to reinterpret it. What could be the end result scenario um, if the there's 30th. a crisis on June 30th? What can the okay. U.S. do? And there's one question over here. Ken? Yeah? Oh, yeah. Ken Audrey? Please speak into the mic. Oh my God, Ken, how my are you? My name's Ken Audrey. It's been a long time. Former FSO for Foreign Service. Um, Thomas Friedman had an interesting op-ed, I think in yesterday's Time, mm -hmm. New York Times, if I'm not mistaken, in which he suggested that one of the keys to find a, cons a consensus for Egypt's future might be its, its budding... Uh, environmental movement. Uh, what do you people think about that suggestion as a, as a way to find common ground and maybe there are some other areas like for example tourism as Mr. Zogby mentioned. Thank you. Great. Brian can I have you start in response to the first very Sure, I mean, that's a great question, and I think my first answer would be the balance of FMF and ESF, and we've recommended this, is that over time we should start to shift that balance. I, I'm not somebody who's persuaded, and I know there's different views on this, that cutting FMF, uh, cutting our assistance projects to their security and military will make some grand statement about uh, how their political transition should go. And I've, I've not been dissuaded. I don't know how that works out uh, in reality. But with the FMF, and one thing we, we recommended actually with Mark Mullen and a few others that were part of this group, is that there needs to be an evolution of what types of assistance the U.S. and others try to provide to the Egyptians. That M1A1s, and you're familiar with this, the, the, the sorts of things that have been wrapped up for years in contracts uh, seem less relevant to the day-to-day -day law and order and security situation. Situation. I mean, the other top line from my trip to Egypt last week, last month, that, that alarmed me, and I don't know if Dina heard this too, but the, the, the basic crime and law and order and the absence mm -hmm. of police actually uh, being able to take care of those sorts of issues. And I know that's always been a weak spot in the U.S. government side of things of police training and assistance, but that's on the FMF. Um, I mean, my main advice would be not to cut this, but to signal 
uh, you, Congress, and the administration should signal that we're prepared to overhaul this immediately. Um, and, and right now, the current policy is to try to link all of this assistance and the cash transfer that's still proposed to the Egyptian government to the IMF package, right? And I think there's some wisdom to that. But the problem with that is that it's, try, I think, trying to force the Muslim Brotherhood-led government to place a bet against its own ideology and say, we're going to offer this carrot of assistance um, in, in, you know, in concert with the rest of the world uh, and the IMF. And I'm not certain that it's motivating the Egyptian uh, Brotherhood to be either more democratic or more effective in their economic policies. But the main point would be a, a gradual evolution. Uh, and, and quite frankly, I, I'd be surprised in, the, in a couple of years if we're having this discussion, if Egypt tends to go on this, uh, this trajectory, there's going to be no support in Congress for continuing this assistance. Mm -hmm. And I think the, the question that people in Egypt and the leadership in Egypt should ask is, has Egypt already lost America? Mm -hmm. Good point. Yeah, if you, it, yeah. If you look at the uh, polling that uh, you guys did, uh, Egypt has lost America. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the poll that just came P rec out much. recently. Huge difference, yeah. disparity. People are yeah. tired of Egypt, tired of listening to this uh, issue being on our agenda. I think that um, we should be cautious about uh, cutting FMF at this point, given the only organization in Egypt that has any popular credibility at all is the army. Maybe this isn't necessarily the time, but I agree over time, the nature of that FMF funding should change. We should not be adding to the huge weapons and so on. Perhaps some democracy training, some education programs, some more use of FMF for the kinds of things like, like disaster, uh, uh, ability to deal with disasters, the collapse of buildings and so on. All those things could be positive and could actually give us more strength in the countryside uh, with the people who care about that kind of thing than another F-16 or another. Uh, so. It's not so much the mount as it is the character of the FMF. On the ESF, who cares? I mean, fundamentally, it's such a drop in the bucket now, the Egyptians won't walk across the street to get the ESF. Uh, so uh, maybe we should just keep on scaling that down. Well, if, I mean, for me, I'll, I'll tell you this. I mean, I completely agree with Brian wholeheartedly that this package has not been reviewed forever and needs to undergo a serious review. There needs to be, you know, we need to figure out how much and what have we gotten in exchange for this assistance exactly. This idea that we need to continue to, you know, fund the military because they maintain the peace with Israel. Let's take a step back and look at what Egypt's own interests are in maintaining peace with Israel. Egypt has its own reasons for, for keeping the peace. Um, for me, uh, when it comes to either the military assistance or the ESF, I want to see, you know, speaking as, as, as an Egyptian at least, I would like to see benchmarks on assistance. I would like to see sort of objective parameters for if you know, an NGO law is passed that does not meet international standards for freedom of association, then there are consequences. The consequences have never been serious when it comes to the U.S. Um, anytime we've talked about condition, conditioning foreign assistance, a national security waiver has been inserted almost instantly, saying that the U.S., um, you know, uh, uh, the State Department can certify that if it's not in the interest of the United States, then, you know, the conditions go out the door. And that has been exercised, and, and that's quite unfortunate because then the message that's being sent to the Egyptian government and the opposition alike is that the U.S. doesn't mean what it says. There are no genuine consequences. So that's, that's what I would say about that. I would also say that there has been a tremendous emphasis on economic assistance since the revolution, which is great because the economy is, is, is in trouble. But it, America, let's face it, America alone can't do this. And there is money coming in from Qatar and Saudi Arabia, as the ambassador oh, yeah. said. Um, however, I will also remind, remind you that during the Mubarak regime, the economy, the macro economy, was doing quite well. Mm -hmm. But that alone was not enough to quell sort of the, the political disturbances and the agitation that was there. So if we just, you know, singularly focus on economic assistance without understanding sort of the, 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 the anger on the streets and what's feeding that, that has to do with issues other than, you know, the economic crisis, then, you know, we're, we're still going to see continued instability. But Dina, well, I would... I, I, I would say that the, I, we, we didn't ask the question in this poll, 
but we have asked it in previous polls and I was struck by the lack of change in the Egyptian responses to the rank order of priorities before Tahrir and after Tahrir. It was the only country where they didn't move. In every other Arab country, even countries where there wasn't a revolution or any prospect of one, there was what I call the Arab Spring effect. Political issues rose to the top. In Egypt, the number one issue is jobs. Mm -hmm. In Egypt, the number two issue is health care. Then it's, it's education. It's all structural and it's all, it's all need-based. Political stuff came way down at the bottom in Egypt still. And, and I would say that one of the top four is corruption, corruption and nepotism. And it's still there. And so the issue is that... And that's that, governance, though. Right, it's yeah. It, the, the issue is that I think what brought people out and what continues to bring people out is that it's not working. And it's that economy question. The fact that this, this government has failed miserably in providing what it most was expected to deliver, which is what the Brotherhood was known for, for jobs, social services, mm -hmm. and meeting people's needs. And that has not been met. That's, the, that's where I think the, the, yeah. the opposition needs to go. It's mm -hmm. not about, I don't want to sound, I mean, this is a, a, a sort of weird quote and you don't want it, but it's not about democracy. It's basically, at the end of the day, it's about people's needs. Mm -hmm. It's about, does this society work to take care of the people it's supposed to be helping? And it's not doing it right now. Okay. Yeah, let me just say, on, Briefly, uh, no, what you're, to, Dina, uh, you can't change the structure of our assistance until you change the way Congress puts it through the legislation. Uh, these are uh, line items in legislation. Uh, the administration can't change it. You can't sequester it. Uh, we've had a Supreme Court case about that. So Congress has to change, or we have to change Congress and the way it deals with things to take it out of that yeah. context yeah. where it's a line item. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, That's what I meant when I said review. Okay. Yeah. Real uh, quick, course. Muhammad's question wasn't answered. I don't think anybody has a clear answer to your question is why. Right. And then, can, um, can your question, I think it's a it, Friedman's always creative, and I think this is what we're trying to say here is real issues, what Jim just said, basic issues. If, if the water issue really comes to the fore, which I suspect it will in many countries in the Middle East, it could become a political issue if you have leaders who are speaking to it, not just movements, but leaders. Mm -hmm. Art Hughes right here. Yeah. Hi, Art, Art Hughes, MEI. Thanks very much, Jim. Thank you all. It's been very provocative, very interesting. A question about democracy uh, and vision. Without vision, the people are lost, of course, but Democracy implies an uh, acceptance of plural, pluralism. Now, is pluralism something that Egyptians across the board are really interested in as far as the future of their country? Are they willing to be, somebody you said, respect other people's views, other people, people are not like themselves, but is pluralism something that would really be accepted across the board in Egypt? And a final question all the way in the back. There's a gentleman with his hand up. Uh, thanks, Robert Mertz. Uh, I wondered if the panelists could put some numbers on the likely voting uh, along the various tendencies you mentioned. You've, you described very nicely mm. the 5,000 respondents and the proportional distribution, but in terms of how that might play out in terms of an election. Yeah. Okay. Should we, who would like to take the, the pluralism uh, question, and then we'll end with Jim. Um. Sure, I'll start. Um, look, I think I think that you you've touched upon something which is a challenge, which is that you know this free, open society where everybody has an opinion and asserts it strongly and asserts it even rudely, <laughs> and and uh, you know modern Egypt um, is 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 great. It's it's very encouraging, but at the same time, um, is there is there has there been instilled over the years this culture of genuine dialogue, um, you know, and genuine acceptance of the other. I, I think we still have a long way to go. Um, but if you ask me, I am still biased towards the opposition insofar as they actually have attempted to form alliances and have attempted to reach out for genuine dialogue to the Islamist counterparts and it's really, um, you know, their views were, were never ultimately taken into account. Um, just my final point to Jim is that um, I actually do think that it's ultimately about democracy because um, economic reform cannot happen with, with a crisis 
crisis and confidence in your leadership. In order to take important and critical and hard decisions, your people have to trust you. They have to trust that you run a non-corrupt and transparent government, that your concern is ultimately not for yourself, but for the people. So ultimately, governance is, is the underlying problem here. I, 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 I don't see the sort of distinction, the, the dichotomy between it's the economy and you know democracy really isn't the issue. I think it's all the same issue ultimately. Just yeah, final I, thoughts from Ned and Brian. Yes. Yeah, I don't. Uh, I don't think the vast majority of Egyptians have the foggiest idea what democracy is. I think there are people in the cities that some know, people who in some of the academic community have a fairly good idea, but when it comes right down to it, democracy doesn't have resonance with the Egyptian people, the larger majority of people. I'm not suggesting for a moment that they wouldn't want or aspire to this, but I don't think that we've done a good job of explaining what it is that uh, we mean when we talk about democracy. What the tendency is to see what the Americans want is control. They want to use democracy as a way of gaining uh, an outweighing uh, role in their own country, uh, in invasion, if you will, of the West. Uh, and we have to do a much better job, and not just we, but the, the European countries and so on, getting this idea across. Why is it good for people? Uh, too many people say that. I'm, I got to worry about bread on the table, not about some idea. <coughs> Brian, just final as a thoughts? final thought and, yeah. on where are the U.S. interests, I think, uh, as I tried to say in my opening remarks, the region, and not just Egypt, has entered into this prolonged period of transition. And change is coming, given the crushing demographic, social, political, and economic pressures these societies are facing. We have, I think, been too passive in recognizing this. I see the Arab uprisings and the transitions that you, you guys are looking into as a strategic shock to the region that we have, uh, ourselves have not analytically absorbed. It's like the 1979 revolution in Iran. It's like the Gulf War. It's like the war on terror. But it's coming from within. And the US government's way of doing business the way it's done for decades has not changed substantially. The types of engagement and really understanding multiple centers of power and multiple political forces. We had the luxury of not having to do that. Mm -hmm. And now we don't. Uh, but unfortunately, we're too reactive, we're too tactical, and we're too still crisis management oriented in places like Egypt. And I, I hope you know these sorts of discussions help us change the way we've done business for decades. Do you want to address that final question, Jim, and any final thoughts? The, um, uh, we don't have a number on that, on vote, on who would vote or how they'd vote or what they'd, you know, what they'd, they'd do in, a, in an election. It's, it's going to depend upon um, a lot of factors, who runs um, and the degree of organization uh, of the opposition and the vision that's projected by the the leadership. If there's a if there's a, a, a an attractive candidate, that 28 percent though who say I'm I don't think anything's going to change in Egypt. Uh, that's the worrisome one. Uh, that's the I stay home and don't vote crowd. In the last election, the biggest one in Egypt was a little over 50 percent turnout, which doesn't track too differently. Uh, the candidate who won a slight majority of the slight majority of people who voted comes out about 26, 27 percent, and that's pretty much where we are right now, which means Morsi's vote personally didn't contract or expand since he's been in office. It's down to its, his, his, probably his, his, his base. Uh, the, the question of getting that other 70 percent to sort of reflect change and, and make a difference in the polls, that's a whole series of questions that we didn't get into and won't be able to until there's a real, there's a figure to put there um, and, a, and, a, and a platform for that figure to see whether or not it attracts people. But on the question of democracy and dialogue, I, I, that, those numbers say something to me. I mean, people didn't choose the military as the number one option for, for, for moving forward. They didn't choose um, that, they chose this which says to me uh, uh, an, an acceptance of the notion that the way forward is we have to talk to each other. And I, I, I think it's a hopeful sign because frankly, as much as we can sit here and trash the, the, the brotherhood or the way it's behaved, and go, it's 27% of the population. It's organized, it's disciplined, it's real. It's not going away. And there's not gonna be, if, if it's true in Syria, 
If it's true in Iraq and Lebanon, it's true in Egypt. There's no victor or vanquished. There has to be national dialogue, and all the parties have to come to at least an agreement to coexist as a country in order to move forward. And so this is a hopeful sign, and one needs to build on this yes. one as much as on anything. Egypt needs to reconcile itself to itself in order to move forward as a pluralistic society. That's what I'd come forward with. Well, and let's hope Egypt can get there in the next few years. Thank well, this you. has been a fascinating poll and a fascinating conversation. Please join me in thanking our panelists. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.